This first session will be devoted to a general introduction to the Gospel of John. It's very important in, uh, when we come to deal with a document that's been a word of life within the church and the Christian community at large for almost 2,000 years to have some idea of the sort of situation that generated it. And uh, hopefully to draw some lines that associate this Catholic Christian community in this place with the sort of experience of Jesus and this word of God, this word on Jesus, this story of Jesus um, that joins us across the centuries, across the millennia. So uh, this is, a, is called a, a, an introduction to the Gospel of John before we settle down to look at the text itself. I want you to start, as I think it's always good with, with you dealing with uh, the Bible or any text, to have a look at texts that pose a question. In John 9, in chapter 9 of, of John's Gospel, we're dealing with the story of the man born blind. And at a certain stage, the opponents of Jesus, they're called both Jews and Pharisees, we'll come back to this question later on in this introduction, the, the opponents of Jesus get to a stage where they want to deny that there ever was a miracle. Now if you want to prove that somebody wasn't born blind, who are the best people to ask? Very good top of the grade all of you. <laughs> parents. So they call the parents and they ask the parents rather mockingly whom you say was born blind. How can this be? Well the parents won't buy into this and this is the answer they give. How he now sees we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Very important. How and who? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews. In inverted commas. Notice that. I'll come back to this later on. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ was to be put out of the synagogue. And I give you the Greek word there. Yeah, well, by the time you finish today, you'll know some Greek as well as some New Testament. Apo synagogos. Now, if I was to tell you that the Greek for apo means away from, you can guess what the rest of the word means. Apo synagogos. Pushed away from the synagogue. If you were to turn over a few pages, you'd come to 1242. 1242 is found right at the end of Jesus' public ministry. And at this stage, John, the evangelist, is asking the question, a very important question in early Christianity. St. Paul agonizes over it in Romans 9 to 11. Why did the Jews not accept Jesus? For John, it's so obvious. Why didn't they accept him? And he gives various reasons, some more helpful than others. But in the end, he admits, before he goes on to the last discourse before Jesus' passion, he says, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, this same group from John 9, eh? Pharisees, Jews, they did not confess it lest they be put out of the synagogue. Aposynagogos again. You notice? Confess again. If anyone would confess Jesus to be the Christ, they were to be put out of the synagogue. They did not confess it, lest they be put out of the synagogue. And if you were to turn over to chapter 16, verse 2, and now we're in last discourse, and Jesus is talking to the disciples. And he talks to them about the future suffering that they will have to go through. Now, of course, during the reading of this text at the end of the century, this is already happening to them. Eh? 
The text is written, comes about at about the end of the first century. So Jesus speaking during his life is foretelling what in fact is happening to them. They will put you out of the synagogues, upper synagogues. And then he adds something else, not just something that will happen to them as Jews, but something that will happen to them in the wider Greco-Roman world. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. And this is a part of the eventual process of persecution because the Christians were regarded as atheists. The Christians did not accept the pagan gods, the Roman gods, especially the Roman Emperor as God. And so therefore they were atheists and so they would be persecuted and killed and people would do that thinking they were offering a service to God. Okay? So let's not worry too much about that, but they will put you out of the synagogues. That word, aposynagogos, is only found in these three places in the whole of Greek literature. Only here. This is a word that is specifically associated to something that was going on among this group of Christians who are confessing that Jesus is the Christ and being put out of the synagogue. Late in the first century, it's a bit hard to determine exactly when and a bit hard to determine how quickly this was implemented, but late in the first century <laughs> there was what we call a parting of the ways. The earliest Christians had no problem with continuing their life as Jews. They celebrated the great Jewish feasts. Their God was the God of Israel. But they believed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. And this remains the great problem between Jews and Christians to this day, doesn't it? Not the question of God, but the question of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And so, in the period after the war, 70, after the Jewish war, we find Christians and Jews both trying to work out their self-identity. The Jews have lost their city, their temple, and their land, and their priesthood, largely. The Christians want to continue as Jews in the synagogue, which was the only remaining place where Jews met because there was no longer a temple. But can you imagine a situation in the 70s, 80s, 90s? They're in the synagogue and in the morning prayer, they're all praying for the coming of the Messiah except for half a dozen down in the back row they're saying idiots he's come already <laughs> you've got a problem there was a problem it wasn't quite as simple as that but there was a problem within post-war Judaism struggling to get itself together as a synagogue based Torah, Word of God based people of God now that they've no longer got a temple, no longer got sacrifices, no longer got a priesthood, now they're focusing on synagogue and Torah, Word of God. And they find themselves faced with this small group of people who believe that Jesus Christ who was executed was in fact the Messiah. And this was creating great tensions in the community. Now, as I say, we can't be absolutely sure of when this happened and how quickly it was implemented across the Christian church and the Jewish relationship with the Christian church. But it no doubt made an impact on the Christian community that lies behind the Gospel of John. And this was a decision made towards the end of the first century 
they inserted a blessing into their morning prayer which is a prayer called the 18 blessings and they inserted a 12th prayer a 12th blessing it was a new one that left them with 19 and that didn't worry them too much <laughs> so the 18 blessings now had 19 blessings in it because they added a 12th blessing and again we can't be certain of this text but it runs something like this so they're blessing God for giving them the night that they slept well. They're blessing God that they've woken up in the morning still healthy. They're blessing God for the light of the day. They're blessing God for their food. It's a very beautiful prayer. And in the middle of it, they put, For the apostates, let there be no hope. <laughs> and let arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. Not a bad prayer. <laughs> Let the Nazarenes, the Christians, and the Minim, the heretics, be destroyed in a moment. And let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be inscribed together with the righteous. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who humblest the proud. This is a definitive moment in the exclusion of the Christians from synagogue worship. This is a prayer that was prayed by the community in the synagogue. How are the Christians going to pray this? And so gradually by the use of this prayer there's this parting of the ways and the Christian church becomes less and less a synagogue church. And the Johannine community the community behind this gospel is experiencing this and this experience is reflected in those three texts that I gave you. The story of the man born blind leads eventually to them deciding you are born in utter sin and they throw him out of the synagogue. They cast him out. In the Greek it's it's wonderful. Ex ebalon auton exo. They threw him out twice almost, you know. <laughs> they threw him out out. So there's a, this physical elimination of a community from the synagogue. Well, that's all very fine. Once you're out, where do you go? And this is an important question, and this is very associated with the theme of joy of today's, th of today's reflection on the gospel. Because the fourth gospel <coughs> takes a different strategy both theologically and in terms of the way it tells the story than the other three. The other three we know them as synoptic gospel because you can put them side by side and they're much the same. You can look at them with one eye, with your eye, synopsis. You can't, John never fits their schemes. There are little patches where it's close but generally speaking it never fits their, it's, it's the, 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 the whole structure of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels still largely reflect a Jewish understanding of Jesus Christ and a Jewish understanding of Messiahship and of Son of God. John transforms this because they are now separated from the synagogue and it's pretty clear that they are now geographically a long way from Israel and in my opinion and in the opinion of other scholars they have got there through a long geographical journey. The community most likely began in Jerusalem. I think it spent some time in Samaria, Transjordan, but finishes up most likely in the traditional site of Ephesus. A great international cosmopolitan city. A big crossroad city where all the religions came, all the people came. A melting pot of Greco-Roman religions, Jews are there practicing their faith, the beginnings of influence from the Eastern religions, and it's all happening in exciting Ephesus, where to go for a good time. 
like the rest of Australia thinks of Sydney. <laughs> so Ephesus was where to go, the place to be. There's no point in telling the story again the way Matthew, Mark and Luke told the story. Because the world it was being addressed to would say, what's all that mean? And so what we find with John, and this is an amazing, an amazing step, clearly under the inspiration of the Spirit, as well as under the direction of an extremely charismatic and gifted and God-filled, Christ-filled author who we know as the beloved disciple. They write the gospel in a new way because they are now in a new world. This, of course, is the perennial challenge of proclaiming the gospel, isn't it? To, to tell the old story in a new way. And that's what John does. In many ways, John is a paradigm for the new evangelization. The same message has to be told, but it has to be told in a way that is relevant to the people to whom it is being told. <coughs> And so the Gospel of John, now out of Judaism, now after its own physical journey, finally ends in Ephesus, and they want to tell the story of John, a story they've been telling for a long time. This story is the story that's originally told to them by the beloved disciple and told over and over and over again of over a long time. Jesus dies about 30. The Gospel appears about 100. People often say to me, you know, what you say about the Gospel of John and about the other Gospels, if it comes to that, it's all a bit, it's all a bit cunning. It sounds to me as if you invented this. You know, this really isn't in the Gospel of John. And you'll see us do this. When I talk to you in a moment about, when, when Sister Mary talks to you about the prologue and when I talk to you about the Cana to Cana section, you say, ah, oh, you invented that. You didn't. Yeah, that's not in the Gospel. Well, I ought to that I say, the Gospel of John took 70 years to write. They began talking about Jesus in 30. They kept talking about him, telling one another his story. And eventually this story is shaped across a wandering church for 70 years. And then it comes to light in the form that we have it. Would have had many other earlier forms, but the form in which we have it comes out around about a hundred. And I say to people, if I had 70 years to write a book, I wouldn't have a comma wrong. It would be exactly as I wanted to say it. And that's the way the Gospel of John is. It's exactly the way John wanted to say it. Sometimes that creates difficulties for us, but that's our problem, not John's problem. So we have to work hard to try to make sense of this old story told in a new way. I'll just give you a couple of indications of the way in which John is unique. We'll unfold a number of these things as we go through the two days. First is 316, central to the Gospel of John. God is a God who so loved the world that he gave his only son absolutely unique to the Gospel of John. This is, of course, in the USA, the great sporting thing. If you ever watch any great sporting event, any of them, at some stage you'll see someone raise a banner and it'll have John 3.16 on it. Or even just 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son not to judge the world, but to save it. This is a brand new and unique presentation of the reality of God. And the mission of Jesus will be to make that God known. To make a God of love known. Not only a God of love, but a God who is love and loves so much that he sends his son. This is unique. And therefore, Jesus, as Mary will show you shortly, is not just... <laughs> A child born of God through a virgin birth. None of that in John. Jesus is the very word of God. Jesus is God speaking to the world. 
another completely new notion not far into the Greco-Roman world into which he's speaking however where the idea of word logos is very widespread but it's never been applied to a, to a human being the way John does it the language they're used to the theology or the application to Jesus comes from the old story the old story in a new way Jesus is the only begotten Son of God the beginning of the Trinity it's not until you get to the end of the century that you start to get Jesus spoken of as an only begotten Son again pagans would know these ideas of God's begetting sons but not in the way John tells it Jesus ascends and descends Jesus comes down from heaven this is so much into our language isn't it when we say where's heaven it's always up isn't it well, we don't know where heaven is but for us heaven is up because of John's gospel John's gospel keeps talking about the son of man who comes down from heaven so this up and down business comes from the world into which John is writing his gospel it's got something to do, don't, don't bother about even writing this down because it's very complicated. It's got something to do with the early forms of a great problem in the Christian church called Gnosticism. At the end of the century, it's just beginning to influence, doesn't blossom till later on. Jesus, because he is the word of God, he tells the story of God. Not only does he tell the story of God, but he claims it, I am he. He takes over the very name of God. Named as I am who I am in Exodus. And then used as the I am across all the prophets against the foreign gods. There's only one God and it is I am he who is the one God. And John takes that up and has Jesus presenting himself as I am. Eternal life following this logic is to know God the one whom is spoken about authoritatively by the word of God and in this way coming to eternal life and you know unfortunately for John he's only got two commandments he says believe in me but his more important commandment is <coughs> love one another so the new commandment is to love as Jesus loved and I say it's unfortunate because if you're trying to build a community just on faith and love, you're going to finish up in a mess. <laughs> and in fact, we, we may not get to this, but uh, John's community in the second century did finish up in a mess. Because it's only based on these two very powerful realities of faith and love, which can sometimes be deeply misunderstood. And the, the letters of John show us how they're coping with this in those difficult days. Now I've just done that for you to give you some idea of how John writes this old story into a new world. We're still telling the story of Jesus who lived in Israel, who preached in Israel, who eventually suffers and dies and rises and returns to the Father and establishes a community. That's the old story. But this is now told in a brand new and exciting way. Before I go to this section, however, the one that's on, I want to ask two questions, or answer two questions. Who are these Jews? Who are the Jews? And you're probably aware, particularly on Good Friday, that when you read the passion story of John the ones who are the baddies are always the Jews the Jews John's gospel has been used as the biblical basis for so much persecution of Jews for hundreds of years the great European pogroms that use the text of John and that terrible text in the Gospel of Matthew. His blood be upon us and upon our children. These are texts that have driven Christian persecution of Jews 
for over a thousand years. And we need to keep this in mind. Uh, this, this story of physical execution and persecution, etc., is not new. It has gone on in the past, and some of it's been in our history. And the Gospel of John, read incorrectly, was one of the reasons, one of the reasons. We need to recognize, I'll give you the answer straight away and then explain to you what I mean by it, that in John's Gospel, the Jews are not the Jews. The Jews are not who we understand as the Jews. Jesus is a Jew. The mother of Jesus is a Jew. Nicodemus is a Jew. John the Baptist is a Jew. The beloved disciple is a Jew. They're all Jews. There's just a few creep in. The Samaritan woman is outside of Judaism. Bit complicated, the relationship, but nevertheless, we could say she's not a Jew in the strict sense. But pretty well all of the characters, with the exception of the Romans, are Jews. And indeed, across the Gospel, there are a number of places where the Jews come across positively. Most importantly, in John 4.22, where historically, Jesus makes the point, historically correct, salvation is from the Jews. True. True. The history of salvation begins in God's choosing of the Jews. And for John's Gospel, the continuation into the Christian church is but a logical continuation. He sees Israel as a sign and a shadow of what is brought to its fullness in the story of Jesus. So, historically, salvation is from the Jews. John, unfortunately, unfortunately, uses the expression, the Jews, to describe those characters in the story who close their minds to Jesus and therefore reject his disciples because they have decided that there is only one way to God and Jesus isn't part of that. And the best description of the Jews in John's Gospel is found in John 9 36 where the Jews say to the blind man we know every time you see we know in John's Gospel <laughs> you're pretty sure they don't <laughs> we know that God has spoken to us through Moses <coughs> of this man we don't even know where he comes from and that's their problem it's where he comes from that matters. The word of God from God who speaks of God to us. They're quite happy to stick with Moses. We know that God has spoken to us through Moses of this man. We don't even know where he comes from. This is a closed religious system. And John calls them the Jews, unfortunately, because of the historical experience with which I opened this lecture. Because it was in fact Jews who pushed Jews out of the synagogue. And he looks back on that period and refers to this group that historically said, sorry boys and girls, you cannot belong to us anymore because you accept that Jesus is the Christ, we don't. They were Jews, but so were the early Joanine Christians. It is really unfortunate for later centuries that the term the Jews is used. But it's there and we must leave it there because it is this Joanine use of the Jews that is in the text. There have been loads of attempts to explain it away. The leaders of the Jews, people from Judea, all sorts of attempts to sort of say, well, not really the Jews. It's the Jews, but it is those Jews who are now living in a closed religious system. 
And this is where we should start in trying to understand who Jews are. Those people who have closed their minds to the possible revelation of God in and through Jesus Christ. And you know what? We're all capable of that. We're all capable of the Jews, of being the Jews in the Johannine term. It is not an ethnic description. It is a theological description. It's a description of what some people have decided about God and God making God's self known to humankind through Jesus. I'm going to reject that. You know, we can also become a closed religious system. <laughs> a closed religious system that is not open to the ongoing and surprising revelation of God to us in and through Jesus Christ and the church and one another, etc. We are all capable of being the Jews. Are you with me? Yeah. Very important notion. Don't want to go too much about this, but probably the most powerful and moving identification of the Jews, in my opinion, a lot of people wouldn't agree with me, comes from a great German scholar who was profoundly wrong on many things by the name of Rudolf Bultmann. And he wrote a commentary in 1941, a German writing a commentary in 1941 facing the Jews. And for him, the Jews are the Nazis. He doesn't say, it, it doesn't say so much, but he basically talks about what I've just said to you. Those who have a closed religious ideological system who reject every other possibility. Now, Bultmann's been criticized for that. You can understand why he felt that way in 1941. Yeah. So we can transpose ourselves from that and get the Jews notion away from a nation and your Jewish friends down the street and start thinking about my possibility of being one of the Jews. Okay? Last issue. How much longer have I got? Five minutes, haven't I? Ten. Oh. <laughs> We're bolting it in. I don't think I, that's right. Good. Who wrote the gospel? What everyone wants to know. Who wrote the gospel? Well, about that there can be no question. Because in chapter 21, verse 24, we are told the beloved disciple wrote these things. But the next question is, who is the beloved disciple? And we have no answer in the text of who is the beloved disciple. The first identification of the beloved disciple with John the son of Zebedee comes from one of the church fathers then there we go Irenaeus who at this stage of the emerging Christian canon, the emerging Christian Bible, because they don't really have one, they're still trying to sort out which ones we're going to use as our Christian books. We've already got the Old Testament, the Catholic tradition takes on the Old Testament, but then we're trying to work out which one are we going to have. And John's at risk because he's so different. Because of all of those things I've, I've talked to you about, he's speaking a little bit to this dangerous Greco-Roman world. And a part of that Greco-Roman world, those nasty Gnostics that I talked about, have made John their gospel. It really suits them, all this up and down stuff, and, and, and to, to, to have eternal life means to know God, etc. And they want to use use the John's Gospel because it sort of eliminates the cross and it's all knowledge and, and so John is beginning to be regarded by the church as it's developing its canon its book that's a bit risky and Irenaeus makes this identification between John the son of Zebedee and this gospel 
in order to establish apostolic authority for this text. This is not a text that comes from a Gnostic world. This is a text that goes all the way back to an apostle of Jesus. So that's the, that's the real basis for this decision. Now I'm going to come back to this as I close on this question. Now Irenaeus is not the first to use a John. There was a John around in Asia Minor at the time, John the Elder, and so that's a complicated discussion. But the actual identification between John the, John the Apostle and the Beloved Disciple comes with Irenaeus late in the second century. In the Gospel itself, and I can't do this in any detail, there is a continual tendency for a disciple to keep his name out of the text. In the first chapter, two disciples of the Baptist follow Jesus. One's named Andrew. Who's the other one? We're not told. Then regularly, we hear a disciple referred to as the other disciple. The other disciple. But once we get to the Passion, once we get to Jesus leaning, leaning on the breast of Jesus, the disciple and the mother at the cross, the finding of the empty tomb, this other disciple becomes the other disciple whom Jesus loved. So, within the text itself, we see a desire of someone in the story to keep his name out of the story. And gradually as the story grows, he goes from an unnamed disciple to the other disciple to the beloved disciple. And the term the beloved disciple is probably given to him when he's dead and gone. This is the last edition. The other disciple, which one? That wonderful disciple who founded our community, who gave us this gospel, who is the beloved disciple. The text itself doesn't tell us who Jesus, who the author was, but it tells us, and it's the only gospel text that tells us the, the author was the beloved disciple. This was a desire on the part of the author to keep his name out of it. And we've spent 2,000 years trying to put it in. <laughs> now, we don't know for sure. Irenaeus is much closer to these events than we are. He may have been right. There are problems with his being right, but he may have been right. He was closer than I am. The basic thing is, Irenaeus' desire to link this text with an original apostle, an apostolic figure, is in the text. A former disciple of the Baptist who becomes a disciple of Jesus, who was the one who tells us this story. What his name was, I don't know. Irenaeus says, John, the son of Zebedee. He may have been right. I actually don't think so. But many do, and they may well be right. I'd like to go back to this now. Finally, how does John tell his story? This is something we'll be spending the next two days on. Oops, back one. Back two. John's Gospel is very simply structured. They often, there's a story often told that Jesus, the Gospel of John, is like a magic pool in which an infant can paddle and an elephant can swim. <laughs> well, you heard my CV, I'm in the elephant end. <laughs> but you don't need to be a genius to see that this Gospel is made up of a prologue, which Mary's going to talk to you about, then his public ministry. 119 to 1250, when Jesus is out and about and doing things. Then we come into the last night. It's a wonderful story. From 119 to 1250 is about three years. From 131 to 2125 is three days. So the narrative slows down, slows down as we get this day by day report. Within those, the ministry and the last night, we have these further subsections which we will look at in due course and we may come back to this slide time and time again. But be aware this is the overall structure, a prologue, a ministry, a last night which is the passion and, and, passion and, resection, and resurrection, 
with a first conclusion. Jesus did many other signs before his disciples. These ones I've gathered together and written so that you might come, might go on believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing has his name. We'll come back, we'll come have, have life in his name. We'll come back to that many times as well. But then there's another chapter, which we'll also have a look at. 21, chapter 21, clearly added in the long story of the gospel, but it has to be read if we really want to understand the fullness of the Joanine message. Thank you very much.